Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We will begin at the half hour. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please let us know by commenting in the question pane shown on your screen. Again, we will begin at the half hour. Introducing our speaker for today. I believe we want to talk about our partnership with .org Community. So .org Community connects association executives and industry partners through online discussion forums, programs, and webinars. And we encourage you to subscribe to .org Community for even more online and live education programming and to fulfill all of your annual CAE requirements in one place. And we also have a uh, we want to briefly promote um, our reception uh, and our presence at the American Society for Association Executives annual meeting. So this year it's in Chicago, uh, which is kind of in our backyard. As you may know, WebCourseWorks is located in Madison, Wisconsin. So it's just two and a half hours down I-90. You go through a couple oases uh, and you're there. Um, so we'll be, uh, we, we will be on the exhibit floor. I think we're booth number 100. It's very like a very round, memorable number. Um, so we'll be there. And we're also giving a reception at the London House Sunday night. Uh, and if you're interested in attending, um, you're certainly welcome to send us an email at sales at webcourseworks.com if you're going to be in town for the big ASAE meeting. So again, if you want to stop by our, our, uh, our reception, network with us, 
put a face to the names. Um, email sales at webcourseworks.com. Okay, and with that, I'd like to talk about uh, our speaker today, Clark Quinn. Um, so Clark Quinn uh, provides strategic learning technology solutions to not-for-profit, Fortune 500, businesses, government, and education. He's an internationally known consultant, speaker, and author of five great books, as well as numerous articles and chapters. And um, he integrates a deep understanding of thinking and learning with broad experience in technology to improve organizational execution, innovation, and performance. And um, I highly recommend Clark's uh, website. He's at learnlets.com. That's L-E-A-R-N-L-E-T-S dot com. Or you can follow him on Twitter at Quinovator. It's like innovator, but with a Q-U before it. So Quinovator. And um, his company website is quinovation.com, like innovation but starting with Quinn, quinovation.com. You can also find him on LinkedIn. So uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, introduce Clark Quinn, who will be speaking about e-learning Mythbusters today. Well, thank you very much for that gracious introduction, Andy, and welcome all. Um, if you aren't, I recommend you have a look at the chat um, and get a little practice using it. Let me know where you're from um, so we can uh, get going. And I will be using the chat a few times to solicit some uh, thoughts from you. So I hope you can uh, uh, give a practice uh, on doing that. I will do my best to uh, monitor it as we go through. I hope we're going to bring up uh, the presentation here. Um, and have the opportunity to um, go through it. There we go. And um, those who know me know uh, I like to start with a calm image to help us relax and open our minds for learning in a proper state before the chaos begins. So I hope you're ready. Um, and let's see, somehow I don't seem to have control yet. Uh, nope, I'm not flying here. Okay, Clark, I'm handing the controls over to you. Let me know if that's working for you. Okay, well, we'll shortly see. Um, uh, that would be no. Try, I'm seeing your mouse. It looks like hopefully that'll work for you. Try switching the slides. There we go, yes. Okay, so thank you very much. You wouldn't want to make your business plan on astrology, just not a solid basis for doing things. And similarly, you wouldn't want to do your product design on alchemy. <laughs> These are proven you know, not to be uh, reliable bases for making real world decisions. So if we're talking about the human brain, arguably the most complex thing in the known universe, would we be expecting to make systematic changes with, on the basis of basically snake oil, what people are selling us? Of course the answer is no. So what I wanna to talk today about is misconceptions and, and learning myths that we're talking about. And as Andy introduced, I'm from Quinnovation, I'm a Quinnovator on, on Twitter and uh, with my colleagues in Internet Time Alliance. A little bit about my background, just so you understand the strange and twisted way I look at the world and can interpret what I say and, and view that. I saw the connection between uh, computers and learning as an undergraduate, designed my own major, it's been my life ever since. My first job was designing and programming educational computer games, which actually ultimately led to my first book on, on learning game design. But I went, in doing that, I recognized and didn't know enough about how to design it. And I went back to get a PhD in what was effectively applied cognitive science. And that has guided what I've done since then. It's about how do we systematically use technology in ways that align with the way our brains work. And this includes uh, cutting edge technology, mobile learning and uh, adaptive systems. But at core, it's been about how do we revise our learning design 
in ways that minimize the impact on our schedules and our resources, but maximize the learning impact? And how do we go beyond courses and start supporting people in a richer variety of ways, having a better relationship and better able to meet all their needs in a very full and elegant way? So what am I talking about here? Um, there's three things I'll, I talk about in, in the book, and there's myths, uh, things that are interfering with our learning, superstitions that are appearing in our practices, and misconceptions, areas we're not uh, fully in agreement on what's going on, and as such, we have confusions that can interfere with our ability to execute. So I'm going to go through those, and I want to start with myths. So let me be clear what I'm talking about here. Myths are practices or beliefs that we may be following and yet uh, they have been scientifically shown to not be effective it has to do you know fundamentally with the work and this may mean we haven't yet found any evidence that these should be done and maybe they can be but right now they're not worth practicing and i want to go through several of them which ones so I want to ask you, and I'm not sure, I haven't seen anybody using the chat, and I welcome you to, to pop in there. What myths have you heard about, are curious about, are you pained to see people keep uh, discussing? And um, if you see over there in your control panel on the right, you should have chat available to you. And if the, if the little triangle is pointing to the chat, click on it till it points down and it'll open it up. And it will say, uh, questions in the set, the way we have GoToWebinar set up, and you can go ahead and type your questions in there, and then uh, Britt Britt can see them as um, the organizer, and she should be able to uh, I read see them. them. They, they yeah. don't have access to chat. Um, right, that's correct. That. Um, oh well, if people are saying where they're from: Vancouver and Oregon and Long Island. Excellent currently in Chicago. Thanks for, for participating, folks. I appreciate that. Uh, Chicago area. Um, so I see you were following in. I was looking in the wrong place. My apologies. So you can use the questions at any time to pop in questions and uh, Britt or Andy will <coughs> let me know which ones you have since I won't be able to track it. Anyway, so I want to talk about some of the ones you'll see here. Um, uh oh. I've lost control again. There we go. So I want to talk about some, just a limited set of myths that we see um, emerging in what we're doing. And the first one I want to talk about is this notion that we can identify who a learner is. This is learning styles. And th there's, we know learners differ. And there's a lot of people selling a lot of different ways of identifying how learners differ or other instruments that similarly categorize them. And it would seem to make sense that we, if we know they differ, because anybody who's taught has seen how they differ, um, that we should be able to identify them. But it turns out we haven't been able to reliably do that. And there was a study by Caulfield et al. who analyzed, they found 72 learning instruments, and this was you know, over a decade ago. Uh, there's been a subsequent study that's that's continued to validate this, and but they psychometrically analyzed, <coughs> excuse me, a representative set of ten that included Myers Briggs, included Kolb, include other ones that are similar to some of the ones out there, and what they found actually they found one that was psychometrically valid, but the problem was it was only one dimension, it wasn't particularly of interest or use, and the rest didn't meet scrutability. And here's the thing, learners do differ, but we can't reliably identify it because they change depending on context, the topic, their mood, uh, phase of the moon. We learn, yes, learners differ, but we can't reliably identify them. Now, this goes hand in hand with another study that says, you know, if we can identify them, and let's assume we can for the second, that we should uh, adapt our learning to how they are as learners. And another Blue Ribbon panelist led by uh, Harold Paschler, who I happen to know, he was my professor when I was in grad school uh, for a subject. Um, they looked at evidence where they were trying to identify the learner's style and then adapt the learning to it. And again, they found that 
<clears throat> there was no evidence that that was of any use. They found some studies that showed it was of use, other studies that showed it wasn't, more that found that it wasn't. But when they found studies that actually were, you know, of sufficient detail to replicate or analyze, they didn't find any evidence of this. And this isn't necessarily surprising. We know that actually adapting the learning to the learner isn't the right way to go. We have a lot of evidence that adapting the learning to the outcome you need makes a difference. We need different pedagogies depending on if we're learning concepts or procedures. Then, so we do want to adapt learning, but we want to adapt it to the type of outcome, not necessarily to the individual. There is a basis to adapt to the individual, and that tends to be how they're doing. If they're struggling, keep the problem simpler. If they're really doing well, ramp them up faster and help them finish faster, let them test out of stuff they know, but not based upon who they are as learners. Another one, and this was uh, our colleague, uh, Will Tallheimer, um, has looked at Dale's cone. And there's, you may have seen a diagram like this where they say, oh, you learn, remember 10% of what you read and 20% of what you see and 90% of what you do, um, you know, 75% of what you do. And it's appealing. We know indeed that, you know, the more you are active in applying the knowledge, but A, these numbers aren't right. And Dale's, this was originally Dale's cone. Dale was just making a qualitative and saying roughly these things get better and better, never attached the numbers. It's not really clear who attached the numbers. One time it was attached to Mickey Chi. I happen to know with her, she was working where I did my postdoctoral studies. She would never <laughs> have done this. And she didn't do this, this, the graph that some people tap. It's just, made up, the numbers aren't right, they're too round, and you know, even worse, people think it's additive. Well, if I have them demonstrate it and discuss it, <clears throat> we'll get 80%, and that it doesn't work that way either. So this just isn't really reliable. Yes, um, discussing it is and doing it is even better. You know, teaching others, maybe or maybe not. It depends on how you teach, but it's much more complex than what this study shows. Generation. Hey Clark. Yes. We have a couple of questions that have come in. Is this a good time for that? Sure. All right. So one is, what are we looking at exactly? How do these images connect with what you're saying? Oh, these are shorthand placeholders for the topic I'm talking about. Rather than have a bunch of bullet points and words, th this is just um, trying to show you. So categorizing people as something, NSFW, that's a joke, not suitable for work, um, as opposed to INTJ or anything. Or if you know I, who they are, can you do something? That's Dale's cones. I was just getting to the 2000s and we'll get to the goldfish as well. But these are just placeholders to represent the concepts we're talking about um, as we go through. Does that answer the question? That's great, Clark. One other question that we have here is, how do we determine who our learners are and what topics would most benefit them? Well, that comes back to your business analysis. Uh, in, in the situations many of you are in, I've been, uh, you, what barriers do they reliably face? Um, in businesses, you would go, what key behaviors, you know, level of performance should be expecting. And then you say, hey, we're not getting the performance we're supposed to expect. We're not getting the sales that we would expect to get. We need to go back and figure out what the problem is. And then when we know what the problem is, and you do a needs analysis. In the case of when you're, you know, supporting a community, you ask them, what are the things you most need? What are the skills you need? And you might coordinate, you know, coordinate that, uh, triangulate that with evidence from their employers who say this is the things that we still are needing. And then once you've identified the need, you align the learning to achieve that. You break down, but it's it's a process of not just taking what people tell you we need a course on X. It's going out and validating, indeed, this is a gap that we need to address. And then you align your learning design to that gap. I hope that answers the question. Awesome, thank you, Clark. Uh, thank you, and thanks to those who are asking. I appreciate ask, having questions, so I 
know what we need to address. The um, 2000s is, here I'm talking about the generations or millennials. There's this view that uh, we can categorize people by generation, uh, that baby boomers are different than millennials, and people feel that way. They, they feel like there's these things, and yet um, generations are, are, you know, trying to bulk, group people into chunks doesn't make sense. And when you do the analysis, and they have, and there are studies where they've asked what they value. One of the things they say is, oh, millennials don't value loyalty to the company or something. And uh, when you ask what people value and work, uh, there's no statistically significant difference between the groups. Everybody wants a workplace that uh, values them and empowers them, and that's not it. And similarly, they say, oh, well, you know, the younger, the millennials want certifications where the baby boomers don't care about that. Well, that has nothing to do with generation, that has to do with age. When you're young and you don't have a lot of experience, certifications validate what you know, but when you're older and you've done things, you can point to your actual experience and say, here's the case where I did this. There's a much simpler explanation than generations. It has to do with, you know, where you are in your career. And assigning people just to a category based on when they're born is really a mild form of age discrimination. People feel like there's differences, but that's not what the evidence demonstrates. And it's easy to do this sort of categorizations. Our brains tend to want to find simplifications, but that just, in this case, doesn't um, bear up. And it helps to address people by who they are and what they have demonstrated, not by trying to group them in, into a, a category. And let's see, am I moving here? Um, I don't know why I keep losing control. Um, uh, I'm not, at, oh, did I advance? The goldfish came up, yes. Um, the last one I'm gonna address here is this myth about the attention span of a goldfish. And it, it seems like people are, you know, looking at their devices more and more and, and you know, and the question is, is this a fundamental change in, in our brains? And the answer is no. First of all, the, the whole thing, an attention span of a goldfish came from is something that did by, it says Microsoft, IBM Canada. Yeah, but it was the marketing group. And they were citing somebody else's work who was citing somebody else's work that was a study on web page behavior. And what they found was that over a period of a few years, the amount of time people spent on a web page dropped. They said, oh, this has to do with decreasing attention span. There are other explanations, folks. <laughs> uh, it could be that the web pages load faster, that they've got more experience at processing web pages, um, they're better at clicking, other explanations. But evolution doesn't change that fast and our attention span isn't changing. We now have easier access to other things, so if things are, um, boring us, we, it's easier to switch, and we are um, finding that, you know, these apps are designed to make them addictive, and we have problems, but it has nothing to do with the change in our wetware, it has change in our behavior. We can switch faster, and we may find it more socially acceptable, but it's not that we have lost our attention span, and all you have to do is think about, you know, watching a movie, reading a novel, um, playing a computer game, we can have attention for hours. Um, this is not a fundamental change in our architecture. And there's more, but this is just an overview of the types of things we're seeing. So now I wanna move on to superstitions. And what I'm talking about here are behaviors we see in, uh, in our industry, in design and learning, that we may not even be explicitly doing on purpose, um, you know, that we're consciously aware of more that it's just implicit what we're doing. So it's not scientifically disproven, but it's wrong. And yet, you know, it's not because anybody necessarily believes this is good, it's just true. So what am I talking about here? Um, let's go through some examples. And um, one of them is smile sheets. The <laughs> There's this sort of belief that's not necessarily explicit, but well, we should gather information about how people feel about our course. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but by itself, it's not good. People's, they did a study there, and um, Salas et al. talked about what science says about training. One of the things is, what's the correlation between what people, how much people like a course and how effective it is? And the correlation is effectively zero. It's 0 0.09, which is zero with a rounding error. <laughs> That's just not useful information. You can do better, 
uh, Will Talhammer has book, you know, smile about performance focused smile sheets that gets better information out of that sort of question. Um, but it's more about, you know, how will you use this and, and uh, do you know how you use this and, you know, and then following up later, that's all good. But just the notion that liking it is equivalent to it being good isn't a useful thing. And yet we see way too much of that. In fact, that's 90% uh, organizations do that. Um, unfortunately, uh, only a third of the organizations go beyond that, at least according to some data from ETD. So that's not good. Um, let's see. The next one I want to go to um, is that clicks equal engagement. And I'm not proceeding here again. Um, the, the slide, there we go. Um, the clicks aren't, are the same as engagement. You know, click to see more. Uh, this is not an equivalence. Clicking can be engaging if you're making them do something that engages their brain, if they're having to make a decision. But somebody who should have known better once said, you know, oh, well, if you have a question, they roll over and see the answer, they'll learn. Actually, they won't. Um, and similarly, just click to see more is a way to cram more content in and make you think that you're making it more inter engaging. You're making it more interactive, but you're not making it more engaging. Engaging is about cognitive challenge. And so just putting in, you know, uh, extraneous clicks, thinking that's going to increase engagement isn't a valuable thing to do. And the fi well, final one I want to address here is, you know, that a bullet point is the same as learning. That if we present content, they have learned it. And there's way too much of this. And, you know, that's why I'm not doing a lot of points. Um, and I am presenting stuff, but I'm trying to connect it to your own experience that people, um, there are too many courses where the expert goes through the bullet points of the content without making it meaningful, without having people apply it. It content dump doesn't equal learning. What you know, learning is action and reflection. Instruction is designed action and guided reflection, and we really should be focusing on this and not um, ignoring this. So these are just things that we see people doing because everybody's doing it without really, I think, thinking about it, but they it's contrary to what we know is really valuable. And there's more, but that's a representative sample. And the last thing I want to cover in, in this bit is misconceptions. And these are things that some people love and some people hate, um, that uh, different people have different views on. And the problem is, how do we come to some reconciliation that lets us move forward? Oh, yes, this. No, that's horrible. Um, it doesn't help us if we don't unpack why. And so um, what I want to talk about here, uh, I suppose I should, before I move on, were there any questions on the superstitions, Britt? I'm not seeing any at the moment. Okay. I'll continue. So misconceptions here I'm talking about, I'm just going to go through a, a sample. And the first one is, uh, in this case, I'm not talking about points, badges, and leaderboards, but I'm talking about problem-based learning. And there's one view that says direct instruction is the only way to go. And uh, a particular paper is by um, Kirshner, Sweller, and Clark, uh, Paul Kirshner, John Sweller, Richard Clark, where they said, you know, direct instruction doesn't work. Uh, I mean, it, free exploration doesn't work, you need direct instruction. The problem was their straw man argument of the sort of constructivist problem-based learning was pure exploration. And we know, I mean, way back in 1985, Wallace Feuerzeug talked about guided exploration, guided discovery, because no, we do know that if people might just explore one small area and not explore the whole thing or try enough systematic things. But with guidance, actually, a different meta-study by Strobel and Van Barneveld find, found, and this also was reflected in work by Jonathan, that if you give people problems and guide their exploration of it to help and scaffold them coming, exploring it and understanding the problem and, and solving it, the outcomes are better. They don't do necessarily so well on a test right at the end but they retain it longer and transfer it more appropriately to other problems. And from our learning outcomes view, that's far better outcome than just passing a test. 
Granted, that's not the way situations organized in K-12 education or compliance training in many cases, but what we should care about if we're trying to equip people to be better, more successful in their jobs, we want transfer over, you know, retention over time and transfer to appropriate problems, and that comes out better. 70-20-10 um, is another one that gets people uh, confused or uh, in violent disagreement. Some people love it. Um, Charles Jennings, one of the great proponents, has talked about how it's been really effective and has many case studies and organizations that have been really effective in using that as a framework to get executives to understand that it's not just about the course and to start investing broader. Uh, other people say the numbers are wrong, that you don't get round numbers, and it's it's based on um, a lack of robust scientific evidence. And the answer is yes. It's the There is scientific evidence behind it, but it was uh, anecdotal in a sense, and so it's not robust. It's a useful tool. So no, you should, 7, 20, 10 doesn't mean you need to use that exact ratio. What it means is if you have trouble convincing people about the value of going beyond the course to extending the learning experience to include coaching and, and uh, stretch assignments. If you have trouble making that an argument, you can use the 70 20 10 framework as a way to talk to executives about their own experience learning and moving forward. So it's not about you know right or wrong, it's is it useful to you or not. Same thing with Kirkpatrick. Um, for me, uh, Kirkpatrick used properly. You start at level four, which says, what's the problem in the organization or what are the problem people are seeing and what need direct, then you go, what would we, if, what would be the change that we need to make to affect that problem? And then what learning course and job support and social network would lead to that persistent change in behavior would lead to changing that metric that we care about. If you do that, it's great. On the other hand, people say Kirkpatrick doesn't effectively measure learning. No, it doesn't. It's not about, is this course um, well-designed? That's only level two, and you would use other methods to do that. But the tying it in and then going and saying, have people changed their behavior in the workplace and changed it going forward. So to me, it's a design tool, not really an evaluation tool. It's about starting at level four and working backwards. Kirkpatrick himself admits that he probably numbered it wrong um, before he passed away. So, and there may be better methods out there for a variety of different tasks you're trying to accomplish, and there's now a successor, but the point being that this is, um, it's useful if you use it right, and it's harmful if you don't use it right, and so you need to understand it. Experience API, some people, uh, love it, say, oh, it lets us track at a finer granularity than um, SCORM. We can not only know if people complete it, but we can see where they stopped, what they're accessing. We can look at their access of other things like performance support resources or using the network. Anything we instrument, we can track. We can even ask people some data that we put into the system, and then we can start correlating it. By itself, it doesn't do much, but you start correlating this with business intelligence and say, Everybody who touches this sales tool does better on closing a deal than the people who don't. Then you suddenly have a much stronger uh, evidence base about how resources are are working with success in the business. If you do, you know, if that doesn't matter to you, it doesn't help. It's not about whether it's the right thing for every t situation. It's the fact that if you need finer granularity data, and increasingly we're finding data to be really powerful, this is one tool. It's not the only one either, um, IMS, but understand what it is and then figure out whether it's useful or not, rather than rail, oh, it's the worst thing ever, oh, it's the best thing ever. Who does it make sense for and when? And there's more. But those are just a sample of the types of myths and superstitions and misconceptions that are uh, plaguing us. But does it matter? Aren't these relatively harmless things? And I want to say no. First of all, we could be wasting time and money. We could be 
investing in things that people have told us matter and they don't, and to the extent that we do use that money, we could, that we could be doing just on better design, instead we're following the latest fancy object like learning styles, we're wasting money that we don't need to, you know, we're burning money and our time is flying away. But there's one other worse problem, and that's that we could actually be doing damage. We could be undermining our own investments in learning and doing things that keep the learning from being as optimal as possible. And that to me is a real problem. And that's why I think we need to go better. Frankly, as practitioners, professionals, practitioners, we should be following evidence base, not uh, snake oil and, and hype. So we have to be smarter about this. And I think we can be, and I wanna help uh, address that. Before I go on, uh, let me check, Britt, any other questions arising? I will try and pause briefly for people to have time to write them. And the flip okay, side. yeah. Hmm? We do have a question that came in. Okay. So what is your advice for creating education with measurable outcomes in the environment in which you don't have a captive audience selling CE courses to members of an association rather than internal training? Mm -hmm. um, my advice is figure out what they want, um, figure out what they need, help them, you know, it's, it's in a sense it's marketing and marketing is all about help people understand, make very tangible to them the pain they're feeling and then offer them a solution. So the, the first part of it is make sure that the courses uh, address real needs. And then the second thing is make learning design courses that are hard fun. Learning is better when it's hard fun. Uh, so you have the right, you know, in, in uh, I think it's Alfred Bork who talked about desirable difficulty. What's the right level of challenge? How do you give them problems that they get are important and will, you know, if I, solve this problem in the learning experience, I will be prepared to solve that problem outside the learning experience and help them be successful and break that up. So if you do, there is a, a we can design pedagogies and learning experiences that um, give people challenges and have them apply knowledge and develop them so that they leave with the ability to do things they know they need to do. And so this involves not just the cognitive science, but the emotional impact as well, and understanding engagement and the integration of that. That was the topic of my first book about engaging learning is getting that alignment right. Doing that systematically, reliably, repeatably, I claim can be done and can be done cost effectively, but you have to understand and create design processes that reliably execute against that. So ensure you have the right courses and then ensure the courses have a design that learners understand and come out going, yes, I now I know I can do this. Is that any, I hope that answers the question. Any others? David says, thank you. And Excellent. that's what we have for questions for now. I'll let you know if we have any more come through. I appreciate that. And thank you, David, for the question. Um, so <clears throat> if we're not going to be vulnerable to these, one of the things is, you know, being able to recognize the ones that have already been identified, but how do we get smarter about resisting them going forward? I want to suggest the answer comes from, you know, understanding our brains a bit better. I don't think there's enough uh, cognitive science understanding in it, and I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour, uh, to, which kind of explains why some of these myths don't make sense. At the first level, at the lowest level, at the neural level, learning is about strengthening associations between patterns. Um, the neurons that fire together wire together, which is well and good, but we don't address individual neurons. It turns out there isn't a neuron for dog and a neuron for fire extinguisher, whatever. Instead, they're patterns across neurons. And the way we activate them is not at the neural level, but at the cognitive level. So unfortunately, most of the stuff we hear about, you know, all this, oh, neuro X is the latest buzz phrase, <laughs> neuroscience, neural leadership. You know, there's really essentially nothing other than the fact that the neurons that fire together, wire together, are important. And most cognitive scientists will say, if you're talking about neuro, you're talking at the wrong level. Instead, we need to talk at the cognitive level. And we're talking about how information comes into our sensory stores, and 
we get a lot of information, but only a little bit of it can we attend to, and it dissipates really quickly. And what we attend to gets into short-term memory. We can be overwhelmed, so focusing attention matters. And what we're consciously thinking, short-term or working memory, we have to rehearse to keep there, but that's where we do our conscious problem solving and where we keep information that eventually gets learned. And we have to elaborate that to get it into long-term memory. Long-term memory is <clears throat> where we store what we know, some of it gets so well practiced, it actually bypasses going to working memory and we can just execute automatically. If you think about driving, if you're a driver, um, when most of the time you can drive home just fine while thinking about something else, it's pretty much automatic. In fact, even if you intend to stop on the way home and not go straight home, you intend to stop at the store. If you start thinking about something, what happens? The next thing you know, you're already home and you go, oh shoot, I forgot to get the milk. Um, that's sort of that <laughs> automatic processing. But other new problems is when we have to recall stuff from long-term memory, get in working memory and, and process it. And then we can make a conscious decision about action. That's actually um, effortful. And so one of our goals of learning is to make stuff more automatic, chunk things away so we can deal with it more effectively. And understanding this is important to understand some of the claims and some of the uh, processes we need to make learning more effective. Um, elaboration, the best elaboration is practice, for instance. Now, outcomes of this include things like the need for spacing learning. The normal learning curve, we'll actually, you know, cram and do well and actually do better on a test than any other way, but it dissipates really quickly. You know, five days later, you've forgotten everything. This was your college experience, right? <laughs> Cramming before the test five days later. Sometime go watch uh, Father Guido Sarducci's um, five minute university video. It's it's very funny and um, quite apt. Father Guido Sarducci is a, uh, a comic character uh, from uh, Joe Novello, somebody Novello, I can't remember. Anyways, um, but, and that's not helpful that normal learning curve, normal forgetting curve, isn't helpful for long-term learning. And instead what we need is if we space out the learning, however, we might not do just as well in the test, but it will be retained there and available um, afterwards. So that's an important element of uh, trying to make learning that is there when we need it, is spacing it out now, the amount of spacing, how much practice we need and how much the spacing, the answer is, of course, it depends, but it depends on how complex the skill is that you need them to retain, how complex that information is and how much of it there is and how often you need, you know, you need it. If it doesn't happen very often, but it's really important, you may need a lot of practice. Think about pilots flying um, and dealing with emergencies. They don't happen very often, but they're really bloody important when they do, which is why they do lots of space practice. And if you reactivate that knowledge, it's even much better. So thinking about that is important to understand that because um, going back to that neural picture, um, that strengthening, you can only strengthen those links between neurons so much in any one time before you literally need sleep to, to go back and reactivate it and strengthen it a bit more, which is why we need this spacing over time for stuff to really be retained. Um, uh, okay, now the way the patterns end up being organized by our brains, our conscious understanding in terms of models. And in fact, we will build models um, to explain the world if uh, that's just what our brains do. Cognitive research has shown that we will build models to explain the world. And if we don't build the right model, we don't tend to throw it away as soon as it's proven wrong. It's not, please, sir, may I have a better model? We tend to patch the existing models and that leads to uh, further problems. And so it helps to give people models. And I will argue that going forward, that the more important and valuable um, uh, decisions that will make a better contribution to your audiences is the ability to make better decisions. And that will come in increasingly ambiguous, unique situations from better models that they can use to interpret in that, bring into working memory, attach to their problems, and use to map to a solution. Now, the thing is, when we see pe mistakes people make, they don't tend to be random, they tend to be patterned, they tend to be people bringing in inappropriate models that seem sensible here. 
and even when you teach them. And so it helps to make the alternatives to the right decision, these models that people tend to bring in wrongly. And so your alternatives to the right answer should not be silly or obvious, but instead should be, particularly in that to achieve that desirable difficulty, should be models they're liable to choose that are wrong, and you have a chance to address it in the learning situation, not in the um, uh, performance situation. Now, there is still some randomness in our architecture. It turns out to be evolutionarily adaptive that um, we randomly try things differently and sometimes they're better and they get reinforced and that gradually our behavior gets shaped and our learning happens and now we can communicate that to others. But that means we're bad at doing rote things. So getting people to do rote things reliably, repeatedly is not necessarily a good decision. Sometimes it has to be in the head, but if it's rote, try and find a way to automate it not have human action as part of it or live with the fact that occasionally it'll go wrong we have limited attention as i mentioned um it's not that it's only eight seconds but it only can we can only attend to so much and distraction can keep us from attending to what's important so one of our goals as designers is to make sure we help people know where they should uh focus attention we should remove distractions limit the cognitive load so that people can attend to what's important and process, pay attention to it and acquire it as fast as possible with as much, as little interference as possible. And what we attend to gets into working memory, but working memory has limited capacity. And we can only hold so many things in mind at one time. And what our expertise does when we elaborate things and bring it into long-term memory and learn it, it increases the size of the chunks we can work with at any one time. So one of our goals of learning is to give us more powerful tools to bring into working memory to apply to problems and make them more automatic. So making sure that we support that chunking of information and aggregating it into useful um, aggregations that we can bring to bear is a really important component of our learning designs. And our knowledge gets compiled away and it becomes inaccessible. And this is a real problem for working with subject matter experts. And uh, John Allison, uh, Web Coursework CEO, actually did his PhD thesis, wrote a lovely book called Mind Meld about how to work with subject matter experts and addresses some of the problems that includes the fact that their knowledge is no longer accessible. And research from USC's Cognitive Technology Group um, shows that 70% of what experts do is inaccessible to them they literally can't tell you what they do they can tell you what they know but not what they do and so you have to work particularly hard in systematic ways with subject matter experts to get what's really important for novices to know how to do not just to know and i mentioned earlier that design for what the outcomes you need and people talk about bloom's taxonomy i think brenda sigru's done a beautiful job of showing that's wrong and this aligns with what's coming out of the uh, uh Science of Learning uh, Lab that's uh, in Pittsburgh uh, was a joint initiative between University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. I think now it's owned by Carnegie Mellon, but they talk about these types of learning outcomes and align the learning, align the learning design to the outcome you need. And I'll suggest facts are by and large, you know, not as important as the ability to apply concepts to do classifying and a particularly process, troubleshoot and improve are going to be the types of um, things are going to make uh, the best uh, value to learners going forward. But recognize the types of learning outcomes and design your learning to achieve them, not designing for the learner. And recognize that different media have different power. We hear all too often, oh, it should be video. It should be only so many minutes long. Different media have different learning roles. And if you want to get the concept, the model down, a diagram or an animation when you want to help see it in context like an example a photo or a video depending on if it's static or dynamic and recognize that you know text is is very powerful um, and you can process it at your leisure but if you're trying to also pay attention to something visually um, having it speech but understanding the properties media and using it up and then mixing it up a little bit for variety is important instead of thinking oh everything is better if it's video no recognize the power of meaning. The simple story is that we want a magic bullet. We want the easy solution. Um, and I don't blame it. I want a magic bullet too to solve all my problems, but there isn't any. There just isn't a magic um, bullet 
what helps people learn to do things is practice and making meaningful practice, deliberate practice, space practice, varied practice, the right practice is going to be critical to developing the abilities that people need to go away with. Okay, so putting this together, you know, how do we deal, we have now a back, brief background in learning science and we understand that there's these myths, how do we evaluate new claims that go forward? Well, the right way starts with cutting to the quick. What is the claim? Not what they say, it's all umbrellas and rainbows and unicorns. Um, no, what is it that this means for me that I would do differently and what are the outcomes I would get if I did this? Let's be very clear on that and cut through the hype and get down to what does this mean for me and my people, my learners, the outcomes I'm trying to achieve? What does this claim actually say? Make sure that's very clear. It's not, you know, uh, bells and, and whistles, but what's really there. Then the second step is track it back. Okay, that's the claim about what it'll do for my people. Who's saying this? And what best in interest do they have? Are these credible people? Are more than one person saying this? Are there several groups triangulating, saying this together and agreeing that this is right? Don't just, you know, find out where is the claim coming from? And this is the hard one. If you really need to understand it, unpack it, look at the original research. You track it back to the research and say, did they use it on people like the people I'm talking about? Did they have the right subjects? Did they have enough subjects to be able to say this with a degree of confidence? Is their methodology appropriate? Were there flaws in um, how they did the statistical analysis or how they uh, controlled for extraneous variables? This is the hard part, and this is where it sometimes makes sense to go to um, some of the people, some of our best interpreters of research who can read the, uh, you know, research in its original academies and translate it into human language. Um, and then um, finally, uh, you know, just give it the sniff test. Does it sound too good to be true? Does this really align with what my experience of the world is? Does this make sense? So with this sort of process, this is the steps. It's a boiled down version of what Carl Sagan said in his nine steps to detect BS and, and Daniel Willingham's boiled down version of four steps. This is the types of things you should think about being doing. Or you go to the source. And it could be this book. It could be in the book and on the site associated with the book at D. Berlin debunkinglearningmiss.com. I point to some of the people on the resources page you should be following. Again, Will Talheimer, Patty Shank, Julie Dirksen, Michael Allen. Um, a number of people have earned reputations for doing this understanding of the research and translating it. I've boiled it down in this book, 16 myths, five superstitions, 16 misconceptions. It's 17 or 20 bucks, depending on if you're an ATD member or not. But um, and I'm not saying you have to buy the book. But find a source, you know, unless you really want to do it yourself, and I strongly encourage you to, but at least, you know, have enough uh, uh, alertness to do it. But otherwise, um, go to the source and try and track it down. So at this point, I want to say, let's stop the malarkey. Let's stop the hype. Let's stop following myths, superstitions, and misconceptions. Let's start being professional and being practitioners, apply the science in our industry. I hope you found this helpful. And I want to say thank you and open up and leave time for questions. You can find, um, Andy was kind enough to mention uh, my blog, learnless.com, things that end up showing up in books and presentations typically show up there first. I'm on Twitter. There's sites for all the books. Um, you can find me at clinovation.com. Um, you know, help organizations fine tune their learning processes and, uh, and the associated resources around that to make learning engaging and effective. Um, but I hope that we have questions. I hope this made sense to you, but I, I hope it gives you something useful to think about going forward. But I hope to address any concerns, issues, or thoughts you have. Well, uh, well Britt is organizing the questions that are coming in. Um, I wanted to jump in with a quick question, Clark. But first, I want to say thank you for the call uh, for us to follow research-based best practices. It is always valuable to hear that, and I definitely learned some new myths <laughs> in this uh, <laughs> in your presentation. So thank you. Um, 
I wanted to ask, uh, so I've, I've already gone to the resources page um, for on uh, debunkinglearningmyths.com, and that's a very helpful list of, uh, I think you're kind of, you're, some, some are researchers, some are probably those translators who take, take the research and translate it from academies to human language, as you said. Um, so that's, that's helpful. I wanted to ask what communities of practice you would advise people working in online learning to go to, um, particularly our audience, since we, um, we are, we're especially strong in people who work in con adult continuing education um, for member associations and industry associations. Uh, there's a certain set of conferences that they, they go to typically. So um, ASAE, the one I mentioned at the start of this, uh, mm -hmm. there's also um, particular conferences for um, people working in medical, like the Alliance for Continuing Education and the Health Professions. Um, do you have, but if if we were to sort of bust out of um, our usual realm of conferences, what do you recommend that that those uh, our audience would look into? Uh, Coast range. Um, I'm reminded, by the way, uh, the series eLearning Manifesto, if you go to eLearningManifesto.org, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there uh, four of us got together to complain about typical e-learning and talk about what good e-learning would be. That's yeah. Michael Allen of Allen Interactions, Julie Dirksen of who wrote the book Design for How People Learn, Will Talheimer, I mentioned him several times, and myself put up a list of eight values and 21 basic research principles that define uh, serious e learning. Um, but so that's not a community, uh, uh, although if you do go, you can sign on and say, you know, buy it. We don't expect you to do it all at once, but if you believe in this, we'd appreciate you signing on. But going on, um, if you're already a member of ATD, they do have a science of learning community. Um, I think it's run by Justin Bersino. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily join ATD just for that because uh, uh, it's not the total focus of what they're doing. Um, but if you are already a member, definitely uh, jump in on that. Um, communities. Well, you know, I would say uh, going to you know, the journal, uh, learning sciences and their associated okay. the society for that's that's going to be academies. Um, the uh, I love the AI and education and the intelligent tutoring system conference because there's people really going deeply into technology and Which, can you say that again? That what, what was the name of that one? Uh, well, AI and education is a conference series, and I think they have a, mm -hmm. a journal as well. And then they they alternate that every year with the intelligent tutoring system conference okay. and both of those are very technologically sophisticated and cognitively science detailed mm -hmm. but they're very academic AECT is the Association for Educational Communications and Technology that's a, a conference organized by academics in the instructional technology field still somewhat academic but a, I think a little bit more accessible um, I like uh, the e-learning guild conferences uh, I think they're a good place and um, in terms of social networks, I would go LinkedIn. Um, I'm trying to think which of the groups, I'm not sure there's one that I think is uh, more specifically scientific than any others. I might go to the guilds. It, you know, if you're doing face-to-face -face instruction as well, obviously the eLearn Guild isn't necessarily obviously the right place to go. There is an association for distance learning. I don't know much about them. Um, they may be more <laughs> higher ed but they probably have uh, a good spread of face-to-face yeah. uh, -face as well. The UW, University of Wisconsin Distance Learning Conference is one that we're quite familiar with because it happens right here in town every year. And it is, it is higher ed focused, but it's definitely valuable to attend for anybody uh, I, working in adult learning, distance learning. A number of years ago. So yeah, um, yep. that's just off the top of my head. And um, I'll see if anything else percolates. Uh, obviously, there's some great books uh, in, in the, I have a list of them on the resources side as well. So reading about it yeah. isn't a bad thing. Um, Make It Stick is a good book. Uh, again, Julie Dirksen's Design for How People Learn is a good resource. Um, and uh, Michael Allen's Guide to E-Learning for E-Learning Design. Um, and uh, for, for more scientific stuff, you can look at Ruth Clark's e-learning and the science of instruction. Great, but thank in you. The, in the reference list on the site.
Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yep, we have a question from David here. We have, what are your thoughts on addressing teaching strategies with the learner, including exposing possible myths? In what cases might it be valuable to expose the learner's misconceptions to explain why instruction has been designed the way it is, or should the design simply speak for itself? Um, uh, that's a slightly complex question. So in general, I wouldn't address misconceptions except ones that they may be holding about what you're teaching them. That very clearly you should address and possibly bake into alternatives to the right answer. Um, so that you can trap it. It, it. They will learn it better if they fail on the basis of it than if you just tell them. Uh, the, as a po and in terms of showing your pedagogy, if you need the t them to take ownership of it uh, and become self-learners, and I strongly encourage that, um, I like sh explaining why, and I found in workshops, that if I chose to use a particular activity, some people would ask, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? But if I explain up front why I'm doing it this way, those problems go away. You know, if I have a good story about why I'm using this workshop, you know, I did do project management as a topic for game design. I say, well, everybody's got some experience with project management and I have an example that we'll be able to use to go along with it. So I'm picking things from a real world, you know, in other words, I can tell the story about why I find that valuable to remove objections, but some, you know, much as I encourage giving people the ability to start taking ownership of their own learning, I'm not sure that's this audience's primary role. And so I wouldn't say take extra time to do that, but you know, address topic misconceptions in what you're teaching and do possibly explain you know, your choices in pedagogy if you anticipate that that will cause people to go, why did you do this way? I don't want to do projects. I don't want to do group work. I want to just sit and listen. And then you can explain it. Great, thank you, Clark. I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. So thank you so much for that presentation. It was great. And I will be sending out an email to everyone here today with the on-demand recording and other resources that you may need from this presentation. All right, well, thank you all for attending. I appreciate it and uh, hope you found it valuable and uh, look forward to um, feedback and good luck to y'all. And thank you, Britt and Andy for hosting. Thank you very much, Clark. Thank you, Clark. Have a great day. Bye.